Hello and welcome to FACT's webinar called Medicinal Grazing and Unexpected Outcomes. Our presenter today is Kirsten Robertson from Pekindale Farmstead in South Carolina. I am Larissa McKenna, FACT's Humane Farming Program Director, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you for joining us. So before we dive right in, let me just do a few quick introductions. Uh, Food Animal Concerns Trust or FACT. We are a national nonprofit organization. We're headquartered in Illinois, and we work to ensure that all food producing animals are raised in a healthy and humane manner. We accomplish this by supporting humane farmers, promoting policies that make food from animals safe and healthy to eat, and also by helping consumers make inf informed food choices. Along with my colleague, Samantha, who you'll see on the screen, I run FACT's Humane Farming Program. And we have the honor and pleasure of working with livestock and poultry farmers from all across the country. We offer, offer grants, scholarships, personalized materials, mentorship, and of course, webinars on a variety of fascinating topics. So please visit our website at foodanimalconcernstrust.org uh, to learn more about these opportunities and all about all of our farmer services. So this time I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed presenter, Kirsten Robertson. Kirsten is a woman who wears many hats. She's been farming dairy goats and meat sheep for over 30 years and is uh, the manager and engineer for the Greenville County Soil and Water Conservation District in South Carolina. Kirsten also currently is the president of the South Carolina Forage and Grazing Lands Coalition and participates on the Clemson Extension Advisory Board. In addition to all that, she's the founder of the Regenerative Grazing Group on Facebook. So we are super lucky to have her with us today, and I'm really looking forward to this presentation. Uh, without further ado, Kirsten, I'm going to turn the floor over to you so you may get started. Take it away. Hello friends, it is so good to see you here today. Um, I'm really excited about sharing my journey. Uh, this is medicinal grazing and unexpected outcomes. And if you are uh, a little worried that some of the unexpected outcomes are negative, I just want you to know that no animals were killed in the making of this presentation. And actually everything came out beyond my wildest chance dreams. And so I'm really looking forward to sharing our journey with you. Larissa. So as Larissa said, uh, we've got a farm, small farmstead in South Carolina. We have 10 acres and we grow, graze milk, excuse me, milk goats and sheep for meat and chickens for eggs. So it hasn't been all fun and games when, uh, well, and I, I wanna share my journey. So we'll, we'll just leave it at that. So one of the issues that we have had over and over and over again is the worm and worms and parasites in our animals, specifically the barber's pole worm. Early on, we didn't know anything about uh, grazing. And so we actually lost a sheep early on about 30 years ago to parasites because we just had no idea what we were doing. And um, after that, we were super conscientious and we always checked for worms and made sure that the um, everything was, was going well. And, and we did fecal counts and we learned how to do FAMACHA and and uh, dewormed, it usually averaged three, sometimes four times a year. Um, one of my most hated chores was grabbing the sheep and having to deworm them and, and the goats. Goats weren't quite as hard because they were dairy goats, they're not feral. And um, so that wasn't quite as hard, but still it just would have, was one of my least favorite things to do. Um, so, what has happened over the years is that small ruminants have become basically immune to all of the dewormers. And this, uh, these statistics down at the bottom come from a, a study where it showed that on several farms, 97% of um, the dewormer 
that is safeguard was ineffective on the worms from that farm. And then that was one of the oldest dewormers. And then you go all the way over to the right where we have prohibit. And that was like brand new, spanking, fancy. It was gonna kill everything. And by the time of this study, it had already gotten to a point where some of the worms, 27% were immune to the dewormer and that's only getting worse. So um, it, it seemed overwhelming and frustrating. And so I decided I needed to do something about that. So about 12 years ago, I learned about soil health and the way we can mimic nature to um, increase the health of our animals and the soil. And I decided to try to use that to uh, solve the worm problem on our farm. So you don't see goats and sheep in the wild dying of worms. Uh, if they did, they would have been extinct a long, long time ago. I mean, I'm sure there are some that are more susceptible, but in general, I decided that we, I should try. So um, I just want to share what I found out. Next. So the first thing that I, I have to say overall, and I'm not going to say it anymore, but make sure rule number one, don't overstock. Uh, it's, it's easy to do. I do want to say that I was never overstocked. I was one of the few people I knew in the dairy goat community who could keep our, we, we had three dairy goats. We never got above three dairy goats. And um, so we always kept our stocking rate exactly where we thought it needed to be, but we still ended up with worms. So I wasn't overstopped, but I was mismanaging and that's easy to do. Okay. So the first thing I did, if we're going to mimic nature, I got to know nature. So I looked at the life cycle of the barber's pole worm. I would suggest doing this for any parasites that you are um, trying to delete from your herd. Um, so the, the barber's pole worm will start with the adult worms. They're latched onto the stomach and the way they work, they latch in and they start sucking blood and they suck blood and suck blood and suck blood. And they will actually suck so much blood that the animal becomes anemic. And if they keep sucking blood, then the animal will die. And um, so they're in there all happy and sucking blood and they're well fed so they start laying eggs and those eggs go through the digestive system and they're in the manure and they end up out on the ground out the back end of the animal um, if there's enough moisture those eggs will leave the manure and oh well, they will they'll pop out into larva and they will leave the manure and they end up in the grass and then they kind of hang out in the, the water film on the grass. They, they can move up the stem of the grass if uh, there's enough moisture. So at that point, the sheep come along and they eat those larvae and then the larvae turn into adults in about three weeks. And then they insert themselves into the stomach and the whole thing keeps going. So I decided that what I needed to do was to break, look at all the different places where I could break the life cycle of the worm. So let's go on to the next one. I made just a really quick and easy um, diagram here to show you what we're doing. So this is the way chemical dewormers work. They, they attack the adult, which is in the host, which would be the goat or the sheep, and they kill that adult. And so that works great because after the adult's gone, there aren't any worms and it breaks the life cycle. Um, the problem is that, yeah, that's fine. The problem is that if the worm, um, if it doesn't kill the worm, if there's not enough of the dewormer or it's just a super powered worm that, that the normal rate isn't gonna kill it, then that worm becomes more immune to the dewormer and then its progeny will be more immune and it'll it'll keep going like that. So I researched and researched and researched all the different things that I could do to uh, medicinally graze to try to mimic nature because I knew that 
that animals out in the wild were probably picking plants that were helping them deworm themselves. And I decided that if I was going to do anything, I was going to do all the things. And that really did change everything. So I wasn't going to go at this halfway. If, if I couldn't tackle this deworm, then, then there, there might be some major changes on the farm. So um, these are the different things that I did. Uh, these were my medicinal grazing measures. They aren't all medicines, but they are all uh, different practices that I implemented. So the first one was management intensive grazing. Overwhelmingly, I kept hearing that if you um, moved your animals that you wouldn't have an issue with worms. And that went across the board for every single species. So that goes for horses and cows and llamas and you know all these different species across the board you hear that moving the animals so that was that was definitely on the list um, no congregating areas uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more we'll talk about all of these a little bit more I did add medicinal hedgerows and we'll talk about that I added medicinal paddocks and I also grazed different species and all of these I'm an engineer um, by profession and so I'm pretty logical and I wanted to go with things that had already been proven to work so that's why I chose these measures. You may have other things that you know of that work and you may see other parts of your system that might need to be changed that I never thought of. I'm just sharing my journey with you. I'm just encouraging you to look at your systems and see what works for you because every single farm is different and I don't expect you to try to carbon copy what I do. Uh, you may have a completely different climate, et cetera. So um, just sharing the journey here and hopefully you'll be able to pick something out. Uh, but by far the first two were the most important is what I found out, okay? So let's go back to that little diagram. We're gonna start out first with stopping the uptake of the, uh, the larva. So if the larva doesn't get into the animal, everything's hunky-dory, right? So we don't have any problems, everything's fantastic. Uh, so we're gonna look at, at all the different practices that um, we can do to stop the uptake, okay? Um, the first one has to do with that management intensive grazing and why it works, especially for the barber's pole worm. If you look at this and you kind of have to turn your head to the side, there's a graph on the right side of the grass. And the graph um, shows that most of the, it shows where the worms are in relation to the size of the grass. And it shows that most of the worms are in the one inch and below. And then at two inches, um, the vast, you've gotten the vast majority of the worms. At four inches, there are very few larvae, and above six inches, there aren't any worm larvae. So if you wanted to play it really, really conservative, you would always choose six inches, and you would never graze below six inches. And that's actually what I did. But now that I'm looking back at these slides, I saw, well, you know what, four inches, there are so few there and, and most of the stuff that you read says four inches. So I'm just going with four inches throughout this, um, this presentation, but it's really the key to everything. And I know it's not, a, uh, it's not an herb, we are gonna look at herbs, but um, it is key to what worked for me, okay? So there are lots of different ways uh, that I found that my animals were eating uh, below or ways that I could make them eat above that four inch line. So to stop uptake, we management intensive grazed, we planted brows, we stopped all congregating areas, and we rotated even in the winter sacrifice areas. Okay, let's move on. We'll talk about each of these a little bit more. So I'll give you an example for our farm. Uh, this is it. It's uh, 10 acres and it was an old dairy farm. If you look, we basically had one pasture, that big old yellow number one down there. That is the one pasture we had and the animals just got to wander around and, and eat. And um, there's kind of a, a 
and looks like a kind of a pencil sticking into the pasture. That is a lane that comes from the barn. The brown square is a barn. And the little yellow box is actually a waterer. So um, there was uh, gates. There were gates there that where the animals could go in and get water and go hang out at the barn and just do their daily thing. Okay. Next. So this was the first step. Uh, I took that one pasture, it was four acres, and I um, broke it into four different pastures. And those green lines are actually permanent fencing. So um, that allowed me at that point, I was, I, I could rotate some. Let's go to the next slide. From there, I used netting, um, fencing, and was able to split it up into many, many, many more um, smaller paddocks. And I could actually get 60 days or so out of all of these paddocks. Each of the, each acre I could split into seven or so, or 14, depending on how I split it. And because I wanted to maximize the rest time that the, um, that the grass had to redo. Now, one thing I do want to show you is the, the, the bright white rectangle. That's our metal roof on our house. And if you look, there is a, um, a fence around it, and that's going to become important. Um, as you can see, I also opened up the yard to the animals, and we started grazing the yard. We were, had been in a drought for about 12 years. The animals were starving. Hay was hard to find. And we were still out there mowing our lawn for um, like two hours a week. So light bulb moment after all those years, uh, we started letting the animals graze the yard. And so we had to put a fence around the house to keep the, the goats from eating all the shrubbery, okay? Um, some of the additional, to try to maximize our grazing, some of the um, areas we added that, that seemed really novel to me, I know a lot of people do this now, but we did decide to graze the yard. Our yard was, it's a pecan orchard, which we're um, grateful that pecan allows the light to filter down and grass grows under pecan trees. So um, we were able to use that as grazing area. The shade is wonderful when we hit 100 degree days. Um, would definitely encourage putting pecan trees in your um, pastures if you haven't, just as some sort of shade because it does allow grass underneath it. Um, we haven't mown our yard in about seven years now. My husband had a really nice big um, ride behind lawnmower and so, we, we haven't had to mow or fertilize. The animals fertilize for us as well. And they also get the leftover nuts and, and uh, get some protein out of that. And they get rid of any diseased holes or anything like that. So been really happy with that. Next. Another interesting thing we did is we started grazing the long acre. And the long acre is something that I read about that happened in I can't even remember what century, I think it was 17th, 16th or 17th century in Ireland. And it was a concept where the poor people didn't really have land, but the township and the wealthier landowners would allow the poor people to graze the areas on the road right of way between the stone walls that delineated the rich landowner's land and the road. And so I started grazing the long acre and that gave me three extra days of grazing. So between the yard and the, um, the long acre, I was able to get another 10 days of grazing that I wouldn't have had. So this, this may not work for you. You may not have a yard that works like this, but get creative. Just think of things. Does your next door neighbor want his yard mown? Um, is there somewhere else that you could take the animals? Just, just think through it and get creative. That's, that's the key to this. Not necessarily exactly what I did, but um, if you don't feel like you have enough 
room to move your animals that many times, then either you'll have to lower your stocking rate or you'll have to find um, somewhere else to, to manage them. Okay. And, and one other little note about grazing the long acre is I, I never leave them when I always, I'm always there at home when I'm there to make sure that, that they're gonna stay inside the netting. And um, I only do it in daylight. I don't allow them out there at night. Okay, so the first uh, way that we don't graze below four inches is to management intensive graze. And the second way is to plant browse. So browse is woody vegetation and the animals eat higher up than they would down at the grass level. So uh, hedgerows are a great example. And if you have goats, goats enjoy eating um, woody vegetation way more than grazing. They're much happier. So they would prefer to have 60% um, browse if they had the choice. And sheep are just the opposite. They would prefer to have 60% um, grass. So in working and mimicking with nature, what's gonna make my animals happier would be to plant some sort of hedgerows. So what we have here, if you look, those were two of the dairy goats and they are pushing really hard into the cattle panels. These were actually the fences that go around the house that I mentioned earlier. And they were trying to get to the hedges, the, the bushes and shrubbery that I had around the house. And over on the right side, you can see where they had shorn that hedge all the way straight up to six feet. It's perfectly straight. And um, I took a, a yardstick out there and it was exactly two feet in from the edge of the fence. Um, so that got my wheels turning because it didn't, it didn't kill the shrubbery. It meant that I didn't, I didn't have to mow or use the hedge trimmers. This was getting better and better. Um, so since they weren't killing the bushes, I realized that it would be really neat to plant forage for my animals and allow them to eat it and allow it to grow back. And um, they could, we could just keep that going. And then if I put the plants in the center and had another cattle panel on the other side, they could eat it from the other side and we could bisect some of our pastures that way. Okay, next slide. And a forage fence was born. So I call this a forage fence. Uh, it's got cattle panels on either side, and then it's got that two foot, I call it a forage zone. That's where the animals were, um, could reach through or above the cattle panel and eat. And then in the center of that two foot grow zone is that's where the plants are planted and they, they don't get in there. I actually will open it up to them once or twice a year and they can clean that out, but they never get a chance to kill the plants on the inside. Okay, uh, let's see. And so what do you want to plant there? I um, researched and researched and researched, and I came across some really great uh, research from uh, Professor Lugenbuhl in at NC State. And he had looked, um, he had looked into what the best forage was for goats. And um, he looked, into the palatability. He was counting what the goats went for and how many leaves they ate, uh, the fastest regrowth. It was browse, so it was preferred. It's off the ground, so it breaks the worm cycle. It's also a nitrogen fixer, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Um, black locust, turns out, is actually a natural dewormer. So for all of these reasons, it just seemed like a no-brainer for me to plant black locust. I uh, do want to caution, it is supposed to be poisonous to horses. Um, I, I had also read where it was poisonous to goats and sheep. Uh, I did a lot, a lot, a lot of research on poison. So I contacted Dr. Lugenbrühl and I said, um, is, is it poisonous? Like, is this going to, and he sent me 30 pictures of goats eating 
the black locust, he had been doing this research for 15 years and um, he said, no, it's not gonna kill him. So what you end up with on a lot of the medicinal plants is they have a lot of tannins which discourage the worms, but those tannins um, can, if, if your animal is, is ill or, um, you know, they, there may be a point at which they will kill the animal. I have seen my animals eat horse nettle. I think they actually eat that for medicinal purposes, even though it is a nightshade. So I have other deworming options over there on the left side. Um, some of those are, you're going to see like tansy, they'll say, oh, that's poisonous. Um, yeah, it, it may be they, I have tansy planted in the forage fence and they, they pick and choose. If they have enough to eat, enough to choose from then, and other things, then they only use it as a medicine and they don't, um, they don't die from it. Um, Oh, 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 the black locusts. So um, black locusts, yes, sheep can eat these too, by the way. They, they like it a lot. I have pictures where I have, uh, I didn't bring them here, but I chopped down those black locusts because they can get 10, 15 feet tall. I can, I chopped those down and laid them out and the sheep are crazy about them. They will not stick their heads through that fence very well. Um, they will eat it if, if the black locust grows through and out, um, they definitely will go after it. So they, they do love it. Um, okay, so, oh, what I do every year in January is I have to go through and I chop off those black locusts at about 15 inches. So just below knee height. Uh, because otherwise they just, they get too tall and they'll start getting growth and, and becoming a tree instead of the bushy hedge that I need them to be. And they always grow straight back up. Um, and it actually coincides really well as a, a bridge between when your cool season grasses are going and when your warm season grasses are, are kicking in, then, then your black locust, locust can come in really handy. Uh, Caveat, black locusts have thorns that are this big. They can puncture a tractor tire. They will embed in your scalp and whatever other appendage you have. They are horrific to work with. And for that reason, I'm actually going to be taking some of my black locusts out. Uh, they'll start to take over your pastures. Um, so you do have to be careful. I'm going to go ahead and lay that out there so that uh, everybody knows. Okay, uh, next. So this is, shows what happened. I mean, they actually really, really love it. One added benefit that I never thought of when I did this is that because the animals are able to eat upward, if I add all of the space around all of the forage fences I did, it actually added 0.25 acres to my entire acreage because I was able to use vertical forage as well as, as the horizontal. Okay. So to stop the uptake, first we had management intensive grazing and then we had planting browse. The next thing I noticed was that the pastures looked great, but when they went back to the barn or when they went and hung out in the shade or when they went and got water and laid down near there, when they got back up, they poop. That's what small ruminants do. They stand up and poop and then they would start grazing. And so that was a point where I saw it was grazed really low or it was mud and they could ingest worms. So at that point, I decided that we would not have congregating areas anymore. So I changed the entire system so that we went barnless and the goats detest rain. But you know what? <laughs> they, uh, they can get under a tree. They, the goats in the wild don't have a barn. And while they were, they were kind of mad at me, they were fine with it. Um, if, if the weather gets super, super nasty, I will allow them in the barn. So I'm not completely heartless. And a lot of people have said, well, for that, I just can't do it. And that's fine. Like I said, this is an individual journey. Everybody has to choose where they are. But our barn was a huge congregating area that was completely mud. And if you look, this goat is, uh, this is a very tall goat, by the way. And she is got grass halfway up her belly. This is um, some rye that I had thrown out in the barnyard. 
Um, so watch for shade areas, supplemental feed areas, salt areas, and watering areas, because that's where they will go to hang out and they can graze down higher or lower there. Okay, next. So another observation uh, was that in the winter, I would put them in a sacrifice area. And since we didn't have the congregating areas, we didn't have any hay mangers. And so I was spreading hay on the ground and I saw where they would be going back to the same hay to eat. And that would be a place they can pick up worms. Now worms aren't as active in the winter months. However, I, like I said, if I was gonna do any of the things, I was gonna do all the things. So I put them in very small paddocks, but we do move every day and I lay the, the hay out. The hay stays clean. Yes, uh, there is some wastage. Um, but they're getting supplemental grain, especially when we had the dairy goats in, the, in with them. We'd give them a little bit of grain, and especially with the new mamas. Um, and I realize if you're fully grass fed, this might not work. But I saw that wastage as added um, fertilizer for my pastures. So I was really okay with that. Um, and the, the hay was clean enough for the new babies. So it stopped any um, of the issues that babies get and, and the mamas from being in enclosed areas where it's a little dirtier and pneumonia and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay, that's it. So that's it for the uptake. So now we're gonna go look over at the adult worms and how to address them. And this is where we have the herbal um, dewormers. This is the exact same thing as the um, as the chemical dewormers. So I had um, decided, like the the thing I hated most was wrestling the animals, and I decided that I wasn't just gonna switch out chemical dewormers and herbal dewormers. I just, I wasn't going to do that. So I decided to plant my dewormers. Again, I understand there are some really good herbal dewormers out there. A lot of people use them. I just didn't want to do that. So again, I'm trying to mimic nature and um, make the animals do what they would do in the wild. They're all very personal decisions and I'm no judgment for any other decisions that you guys make. Um, okay, so let's talk about herbal dewormers. Next one. So I already talked about the forage fence. That was a, a big um, place for, for deworming. They would be able to deworm themselves every single day as they moved down the forage fence the way I had it set out. Um, I also added medicinal paddocks. Um, yeah, so let's go on to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So the medicinal paddocks, I came up with chicory because Dr. John Andre of Clemson University, he proved that chicory had some deworming properties for his lambs. And um, I'm very close to Clemson and was in, uh, saw his trials and, and what he was going through. Now he said that they don't kill the worms. And I think this is really true of most of the herbal dewormers. They, they don't, actually kill the wormers. He said this particular, the chicory, uh, gums up their systems. So it's not really killing them, but it makes them so they don't want to eat, I guess, as much blood. Um, I did plant clover in with it as a nitrogen fixer. So the way I did this is I, I burned down the area. I did use herbicide for that. And um, because I wanted it, I just, I'm going to do all the things, I'm going to do it right, so I set it out so that there wouldn't be any competition, and I planted half and half chicory and clover, and that's that in the little jar in the center. The bottom part of that is lime. I mixed in lime so that it would be easier to spread and, and make an even um, spread around the whole thing. This, it worked great. The animals love chicory, love it. If you leave them in there, you will not have any chicory left. This, actually, even though they were only allowed in sporadically, they um, 
the weeds do start coming in. And so I've had to revamp this about every three years or so. And frankly, with the moving, I'm not sure I want to keep all of the paddocks that I put in. So I think I'm going to even uh, dial back on that a little bit. So let's talk about uh, where we're going to put those. If you'll go to the next slide. So if you look at those four light yellow blocks in the center, that's where I put the chicory paddocks. So the animals would say they're going into pasture one there. They would eat the chicory paddock for a day or a part of a day, depending on how many animals I had. And then they would work their way through, excuse me, through that pasture, say for a week. And then they would come back and go into pasture two. And the first day in pasture two, they would eat um, chicory and deworm themselves and then go down the, the, uh, the row, excuse me, for the, the rest of the, the day. Um, I, why did I plant paddocks instead of just broadcasting everywhere? I asked Dr. Andre, I said, which do I do? Can I just have a beautiful wildflower meadow and have gorgeous chicory all the way through the pasture? And he said, well, you can do that. But because his trials had been made in paddocks, it's a, it's a university trial, um, he said he felt like the best thing to do would be to make a special area that was chicory. So that's why I chose to do that. Uh, it's, I think it was a really good choice because the animals, like I said, really love chicory. And if given the chance, they will go back and gnaw at it and gnaw at it and they will eat it down to tiny, tiny little nubs. It does have a very long taproot. And so it, it does bounce back, but, um, just allowing them to have it a little bit is, is key. Otherwise, it's not going to stay with you. Okay, next. So now the last place we're going to cut off that um, cycle is with the eggs. And so you can address that by grazing different species. Um, any species is good. Now, goats and sheep have the same barber's pole worm, so they don't count as different species in this instance. But if you have cows or horses or uh, alpacas or chickens, those types of animals are going to, they're going to eat differently. They're going to um, break that cycle. And so your animal, your sheep or goats won't have as much access to picking up the larva later on. Okay. So we grazed chickens with our sheep and goats and we had them enclosed and we ended up with predators. And so now they, believe it or not, now they're free range and the predators never get them. And because uh, they go back at night and um, some of our chickens roost like 10 feet up in the tree. They're, they're, they're pretty feral. So we do have to kind of go find the eggs sometimes. But this, um, the, I found this clutch when I was out walking in the pasture and I thought it was pretty funny. It's kind of like wild birds that are, that are um, laying out in the middle of a, a pasture or in a field. So that's what happens when you free range chickens. Um, there was a question of earlier um, about meningeal worms, and those are an issue with deer. And I looked up the life cycle, and part of the meningeal worm life cycle is that they, it has to go through a snail, um, which is a little unusual, which means that generally you're going to find those in wet areas. So to mimic nature, I... And, cut that cycle, I would say try not to graze in those wet areas or maybe add ducks as a different species who would eat the snails and break that life cycle. Every single uh, type mimicking nature, you just have to, to look and observe and uh, see what you can do to, to make it work. Uh, okay, next. So this is our results. We 
we're able to quit chemical deworming. So it does mean that I spend more time out in the pasture, but I really hated deworming. <laughs> and um, so this was just the first of the, um, this, this is a, a success story and I, I could stop here. However, there is a lot more that I wanna share with you, the changes that those management things that I just shared with you, how, what happened after that. So let's move on to the unintended consequences. So I didn't tell you, but I planted wildflowers, native wildflowers in the uh, forage fences. I also planted them in a little area that was, I'm trying to, to uh, mimic a, a Piedmont prairie. We, South Carolina used to have prairies. So anyway, I, I now have wildflowers and it's just gorgeous. So I have flowers spring through fall and this could become a you pick business at some point right now. It's just beautiful, but it was an unexpected, unexpected consequence. Next. So we ended up with increased pollinators, which shouldn't surprise you because we had more flowers. Uh, one fun story is the picture on the left. That plant, that's a, a monarch caterpillar and it's on a butterfly weed. I had never had butterfly weed on, in, on my farm and I planted six plants and I thought, well, they'll get bigger. We'll just go with this. And um, sure enough, <laughs> The monarch butterflies found those six plants and those six plants were covered in caterpillars. So uh, planting nat natives is really important. The picture on the right there, um, that is a, um, a gulf fritillary caterpillar uh, and it is on a passion fruit vine and passion fruit is the only thing that a tiger swallowtail will, or zebra swallowtail rather, will eat. So planting native really, really matters. And then I have a video. Okay, so this is just nutso. Sit here and watch this for a second. This is mountain mint in the morning and the numbers of pollinators and their activity is just crazy. There are dozens of different kinds and they're just crazy. So I thought I would share. Plant native flowers, guys. Look at these pollinators going for it. Hope you have a great day. Healthy soils to you. Bye. So uh, planting native really, really does matter. Uh, you wouldn't think it would, but even just small areas yeah, that are garbage. Planted. Um, okay, let's, we can move on to the next one. Another unexpected outcome was honey. So I, I grew up beekeeping with my father since I was like six years old and it was so easy and so I got three beehives and they um since the 70s when I was growing up we now have uh viruses and mites and fungus and pesticides that I don't have any sort of um control over and I didn't have time to be in in my uh hives every two weeks like you need to be and so all three of my hives died uh, it was heartbreaking but I just didn't have time to to mess with it well it turns out that someone in the local beekeeping club found out what I was doing with planting the wildflowers and um, so they asked if they could put their hives on my property and so he has plans to put up to 20 hives on the property I get pollination and my friends the bees I love the bees and so there's no mess, no smell, no stings, and no cost either. So that's been a really great um, synergy and partnership. Unexpected outcome. Next. Yeah, so this is, this is 
a little bit off the beaten path, but we, and, and I hope none of you are uh, arachnophobic, but we have a lot more spiders, which again, makes sense because we have a lot more bugs. Um, it turns out there is a study from Yale where they talk about the more spiders, the better in a grazing system. And the reason is that the spiders, they don't, they don't, they, they do eat some of the grasshoppers, but they really, they kind of herd the grasshoppers up the goldenrod. And so the, the grasshoppers are up there and the grasshoppers are eating the foliage around the goldenrod, which opens up the canopy for sunlight. So if you had a whole lot of goldenrod, I don't know if you've had that before, but the sunlight can't get down and you'll end up with a pure stand of goldenrod. Well, what happened is that the spiders made it so the grasshoppers opened up that can canopy, you ended up with better diversity. And they even noticed a higher nitrogen content because there were nitrogen fixers that were able to, to come in. So having spiders is fantastic. There is a rule of thumb that if you have look at, they call it a square meter, but say a square yard, you uh, look at that and you should have 40 spider webs if you want to test how your ecosystem is doing. Um, and 40 is a good indicator for how many you, uh, you should have. And I found a fact, it said arthropods are responsible for 80% of nutrient cycling. So that tells you that the, uh, it's a good thing if you have a whole bunch of uh, spiders. Okay, next. So I hung out with the Native Plant Society a lot. I bought a lot of my wildflowers from them and because I didn't want to seed them in that forage fence. If I had done that, they wouldn't have had as much sunlight. It wouldn't, they wouldn't have had as much of a chance. So I did buy some, some flowers and they loved what I was doing. And they gave me this sunflower. It's called a Schweinitz sunflower and it's endangered. Um, they couldn't sell it to me because you can't sell an endangered plant, but they were super excited to give it to me. And that's just a feel good. It was an unexpected outcome to be able to help an endangered plant. Next. Ah, more birds. Oh my gosh, it's amazing walking out and there are just birds everywhere in those hedgerows. They really, really love them. And some of the good things that the birds bring in, they help with fly control. They get, bring you free phosphorus, like they poop on your field. So they're bringing in phosphorus. They um, also add song and beauty. Next, dung beetles. I'm sure most of y'all have heard about what great things that dung beetles do. Um, one really positive thing is that they will break down the manure within two or three days. And that means that the flies that might have laid their eggs in that manure, be it cow or sheep or goat or whatever animal you have, the, the flies won't have, eggs won't have a chance to hatch. And um, so dung beetles are great for that. Dung beetles also fertilize your, uh, your land by digging holes and they lay an egg and then they, they actually get the most nitrogen rich dung and put it in the hole so that their larva, when they pop out, can have something to eat. Um, so one problem is that dewormers, especially ivermectin, as it goes through the animal's system, it ends up in the manure. And when the manure hits the ground, it still has the ivermectin in it. The dung beetle rolls that in for its baby to eat and the baby eats it. And what does ivermectin do? It kills worms and larva. So it's gonna kill that baby. So that is cutting off your dung beetle life cycle if you use ivermectin. Um, when I stopped, using any sort of dewormer within two years, I had dung beetles and it's so much fun. You know, I, I've seen so many videos of people who have seen dung beetles on their property for the first time and, and everybody like squeals or screams or, or gets really excited. It's kind of funny, but um, some people buy the dung beetles to bring them in, but if you just wait, they'll, they'll come. Next. So the forage fences also, uh, they actually gave shade, which is something that I had not ever expected. 
And um, so that helps as I'm moving them down the forage fence to be able to, uh, they'll have a different place to stay in the shade during the day. Um, and it's also a fungi repository. I'm trying to get my, it was very bacteria based and I was trying to get the microbial community over to being more fungal. And if you have trees, then you've got kind of a repository there. Next. I mentioned that we were rolling out the hay. It's actually, we were putting out flakes of hay, um, but you see a lot of people rolling out the big bales. And I said that that was a, a fertilizer. Um, this is where we rolled out. You can see where we put out flakes of hay and um, it is noticeable. And so it's, it's, since we didn't have a hay feeder as a congregating area, we were feeding hay on the ground and this was the result. So very, very positive. Um, you would think, I had a, I, it took me a long time to get to the point where I would feed hay on the ground because they tell you that if you feed hay on the ground that your animals will get parasites. And that was exactly what I didn't want to happen. So um, I finally decided that worms aren't active in the cool season and that I would move the animals and, and try it. And that actually worked for me. Okay, next. So that, that first year, I was able to increase my stocking rate by a third and decrease my hay by half. So that's like printing money. Um, yes, I was out walking the property a lot more, but it, was, it, it became a joy. It became the best part of my day. Uh, completely different from my heart sinking because I was going to have to go out and do something in the mud with the animals. Uh, just another unexpected outcome. Okay, next. Fruits and berries. Now I didn't tell you this, but in that forage fence, those black locusts are nitrogen fixers. So on either side of every single black locust, I planted a fruit or nut tree. And I ended up planting about 30 different varieties. I tried to go mainly with native. Um, so for us around here, pawpaws, persimmons, passion fruit, service berry, high bush cranberry, silverberry, muscadine grapes, hickory, pecan, black walnut, hazelnut, chokeberry. There are two types of dogwood that have edible fruit. Um, and then I also threw in some pineapple, guava, pears, mulberries, and a whole bunch more. So these are the types of fruit that we are now getting that are planted in our forage fence. So there's forage for the animals as well as for us. And we've got our own Garden of Eden. And that's something that my husband had always wanted. And I was like, yeah, right. And now it's happening. It's, it's definitely an unexpected outcome. Okay. And the last thing was happiness. So like I said, I had gotten, I didn't, I did not enjoy deworming. I didn't tell you how much I was ready to sell. And I had been mulling over how I was going to tell my husband that. Um, it was his idea to buy the farm. I had been all in. I had worked um, really hard side by side with him, but I hated it. I, I had come to despise farming. And so this deworming program was my last ditch effort. It was either we were going to kick the worm habit or we were going to sell the farm because I was sick of it. Just done. And now I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change or get rid of my farm for all the world. It has, it's changed everything. Um, and so, I don't know, it, it brought happiness. Um, I just feel really lucky um, now to go out, to take time to observe, to smell the flowers, to um, enjoy the rare gift that I have to steward a farm. And that's one more. Um, so the big thing is don't graze below four inches. That's, that would be my biggest takeaway. Um, you can craft your deworming program however you want, whatever works for you. Just look for these certain things. It doesn't have to be exactly what I did. There, there are lots of ways to do this. Um, but I just wanted to share my journey with you. And that is all I have. Next slide. Um, you can contact me and you can't see it, I don't think, um, but it's at pecandale 
Kirsten at pecandale.com. It's it's under the um, top of the I don't know. You can't see it, Larissa, but <laughs> it's uh, pecandale.com. Another thing that happened when I first started this in 20, I actually started it in 2013, there was no one grazing goats and sheep. And it, um, there were, in, in where I live, there, there really wasn't anybody even rotating cows when I started, I didn't have anybody to talk to. And so I started this Facebook group for me and one other friend who had two sheep. And I mean, we were just tiny, but we were researching. I would stay up till 3 a.m. researching, finding fun videos. And we used that group to, to um, go back and forth and, and do experiments and play around. And um, now there are 26,000 people on the regenerative grazing group. And all we talk about is grazing. I don't allow, we don't talk about climate change or food or, but it's the technical aspects of regenerative grazing. It's people who um, are doing this type of thing. So if you throw it out there, there's people from all over the world and they can answer your questions. I would say that would be a really good place to go. I'm, I'm happy to try to answer questions too, but if you have different animals or want to, um, get some other ideas, definitely contact them. And then um, I'm with the South Carolina Forage and Grazing Lands Coalition, and most states have that. That's going to be, it may be named something a little bit different, but uh, our sole purpose is to do outreach and education. And so join up, see what, what workshops they have going on near you, and hopefully that'll help you out. That's all I have. I feel like I talked your ears off. I'm sorry if it was too much. Thank you. I'm just going to stop the share for a second because I think there were there was some kind of weird um, weirdness going on and I will put it back on so that we can get Kirsten's uh, email address um, and I will be sending out a follow up email later today and Kirsten, I'll, um, I will CC you on it too so folks have it. Um, so let me see here. Uh, there were there's a lot of great chatter going on in the chat um, bar, and we did receive a, a bunch of questions in the Q and A. So um, I'll give Kirsten just a, a moment to kind of read through those while I do a little bit of housekeeping. I have a short poll for folks. I'm gonna just two questions. If you would take a, a moment before you um, disperse, <laughs> just give us some give us your feedback about that. And, and as a side note, I will be sending out, like I said, an email with links to the presentation uh, slides and to the recording um, should, should be later today. So keep an eye out for that. And let me just share my screen again so that we can share. Oh man, it's not, <laughs> it's probably, is that covered up still, Kirsten? The, um, uh, yes, it's still covered. Oh, so interesting. I'm not sure exactly why that formatting decided to stay up there. Anywho, I apologize for that. These are great questions. Um, I don't know how many of these I'll be able to get through, but I, I would, I want to answer them all. Is there a way that we can make that happen, Larissa? Not necessarily now, here and now, but um, thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like that um, if you'd like to, maybe we can take, what time is it? We have maybe five or 10 minutes here if, if, if that's um, on your schedule, Kirsten. And then if there are ones that we don't get to, we can, I can either have you follow up with individuals or we can put together kind of a, um, you know, a written, a written follow up as well, if you like. Yeah, um, let's do that. That's okay. Good. Okay. Um, I'm just going to start at the top and we'll work our way down. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Okay. So uh, can you use tobacco to warm goats? I'm going to say, I don't know. Uh, research it, try it, um, and ask your local extension agency. I, I really, I don't know. There's a lot of herbs that I heard about and I chose the herbs for mine that had scientific evidence behind them. And that's why I chose the black locust and the chicory. Um, there's, there's a lot of people that say that garlic works. Um, and 
then some people say, well, that doesn't kill the worms, but it does give the animals an immune boost, which helps to ward off the worms. So there's, there's a lot of different things at play. So if you're looking at, at different types of herbs or, or plants that can um, kill um, worms, it might not be that they're killing them. It might be that it's making the animal healthier. So anyway, um, if you rotate on pasture year round, how do you recommend managing your herds? Small growth, grass and parasites in the winter. Um, keep moving. It's just everything you do is my key was to, to keep moving. Um, even if you're feeding hay, just keep it going. I hope that answers. Um, paddocks close to square, that's a really good question. The first time I did it, those long rectangles were actually squares. I had them cut in half. And so I had 70 days of grazing, grazing instead of 35. Uh, that was a lot more trouble, <laughs> so I, I brought it back down and it still worked for me. Um, they, they tend to, they, they still use all the area and they're moving every day. So um, you can always put your salt or your water down at the other end. Um, and I know this is a, it's a very small homestead type thing. And I know that's a lot harder for people who have, who have lar larger operations. You just have to get inventive. Even just moving a salt block down to the other end will make the animals go down, if that's helpful. Um, what lengths of net fence? Um, I have both the long, I have used Premier, and I have both the long one and the, um, the, medium size one and it depends on like I know going down those long rows that I'm going to need two two purples and a red and the reason I say that is because I painted the ends of the different sizes of netting different colors so that I know if I need a short run that I go pick up a red one um, because red is the shorter end of the, the color spectrum which is very nerdy and I'm completely off topic but it does help to have them mark, I don't know if you want to use duct tape or spray paint, but it does help to have different colors for your different size netting. Um, what power are you electrifying at? Um, try to keep it above six kilovolt. Um, how many head are you running with your three dairy goats? It was three dairy goats and we, we run generally between now between eight and 24 animals, depending on what time of year it is. But we, we never overwinter more than eight and it's usually less. Um, how often does a herd have access to the medicinal hedge? Every day, because I move them down the hedge so they have a little bit every single day. Goats with horns, oh my gosh, that is a great question. These are all great questions. Um, we had dairy goats and dairy goat people disbud their animals when they're small. And a lot of that is for the protection of the, the person milking because the dairy goat, I've seen some pretty awful um, cuts from horns. So our goats were always, uh, did not have horns. I have struggled with how to do this because I want to get into meat goats now. We've, we've quit we figured out we were getting fat and didn't need to drink milk anymore. Our kids were grown, so we have stopped milking. And so now we would like to get into meat goats, but they all have horns. So I'm really struggling with that. Uh, one thing that did come out of this is I realized that you do not have to have that cattle panel. You can use temporary fence. And that's what I've started putting rows of trees um, along the contour lines, but it actually goes along the long ends of the, the where the temporary fence is. And I just fence it out from the animals. And so you you could open it up and, and figure out a way to work it without the cattle panels. The cattle panels are very expensive um, when you start adding all of that up. And I understand that, uh, but so, you, you can use temporary fence, which would be a lot, a lot cheaper. Um, 
Any lessons from grazing the sheep and the goats together in one group? They get along great. They won't nest it. They'll still, they'll eat kind of separate because they like different things and they'll sleep just a little bit separate, but and there's no trouble. I mean, no, no issues. Um, what type of fence? I use the Premier One electric netting. Where can you purchase bulk herbs for broadcasting? Uh, the I think I mentioned where I bought the chicory seed, but I think that's what you're asking. So either Ernst or Roundstone, I'm sure there are other seed companies that do that as well. Oh, wild chicory or forage chicory? That is a really good question. Um, I would go with forage chicory for sure, because you'll get more bang for your buck out of the, um, the leaf. What is your rest period for, for paddocks? I try to go no less than 30 to 35 days. It is not the same for all areas because even on a farm as small as ours, there are certain areas that take forever. They're just not as healthy and they don't come back as quickly. So the rest period, it's really watching. It's all about um, observing. And frankly, I have fed hay in the summer. If, it, if we hit a dry patch and I see that there is no place else on the farm that is tall enough for me to bring them back in, I'll make it a sacrifice area and I'll just keep them where they are and feed hay there and move them just a little bit every single day until we get some more rain and it, it moves on. And that way I'm not ruining the stand for the rest of the year. So Kirsten, maybe we can take um, maybe two more and I want to be respectful of everyone's time and then I'll yes, yes. wrap it up and we'll get back to folks, of course, with um, other answers later for follow up. These are two really good questions that kind of go together. The bird's foot trefoil, I did, I did, had not tried that. I did see that that um, could be an option. Um, I did plant Lespedeza. Cerisa lespediza, which I know a lot of people are like, you did what? Because <laughs> it can become invasive. I planted the native kind and uh, not the stuff from that is that spreads really quickly. But I didn't try anything. I didn't try the plantain either. Um, I've heard good things about both, but again, neither one had scientific evidence. There was a lot of hearsay about it. Did I move the cattle panels to different hedgerows? I did not, I had the cattle panels, that's a permanent fence. And then the rest of these, I will try to get back um, in touch with you and we'll just broadcast that to, I guess we can do that to anybody who came to this. We can send it to anyone that came and um, to folks that uh, registered as well that maybe are gonna watch the recording later. So yeah, that's wonderful. I know there's a lot of interest in this. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Kirsten. Uh, obviously, folks are really, <laughs> really um, into this topic and kind of the, the practical nature of what you shared is really helpful, really wonderful to hear your story. Let me just do a little bit of housekeeping before we sign off. Like I said, uh, recording the slides will be available, um, I'd say in the next couple of hours. So hopefully I'll be able to get that out to you by the end of the day. Um, everyone will receive an email from me. Um, and they'll be archived on our website and on our, our YouTube channel as well. Uh, do wanna mention a couple other great sessions we have coming up um, in the winter into the spring. We actually just scheduled two more webinars for next week. We're kind of packing them in there. People have been asking for these topics and we're trying to rise to the occasion. Uh, on Monday, we will be um, having Mike Badger from the American Pasture Poultry Producers uh, Association with us to talk about um, what to do with pasture poultry during uh, this kind of this um, highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak that's kind of happening. I know there were some questions in the, in the chat and the Q&A about that. So please um, join us for that. Uh, we also have one next week about how to run a meat CSA, kind of leveraging the power of subscription-based sales. So I'll be sending out links to the registration pages for each of the, the webinars and some of the other stuff we have going on this, this winter um, and ongoing uh, in my follow-up email. So uh, it's 
I just want to thank you, Kirsten, again. I think it's been a real honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, I hope that you know we'll maybe we'll find a, a chance and a, a way to collaborate again soon. Um, I'd also recommend that folks go to the regenerative grazing uh, group on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, it's a wonderful resource, and I'll send a, a link to that in my follow-up email if folks are interested. Um, uh, I'd like to thank everyone out there in the audience. We had a great group. I really love the chat and all the interactions, um, engagement. It's wonderful to have folks that are so into these these topics and trying to um, trying to learn and do the best for their farm and their animals and their communities and the environment. So thank you for all that you're doing and your interest and your attention. Um, I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of the day, um, rest of the week and weekend, and that we're we're able to connect again soon. So thanks again. Hope everyone has a good day.